our nurses know how important it is to do this basic assessment. And that's not only particular to nurses, but we, we have to know what we're dealing with before we jump in there and try to develop some programs or uh, some strategies without actually knowing what we're dealing with. So um, again, if, if we can fall back to the standards of care that are developed for faith community nurses, there are actually two standards that um, talks about what the faith community nurse will do. And basically it says the faith community nurse will collect comprehensive data pertinent to the patient's holistic health or the situation and also analyze that data that is collected. Thank you. No problem. Um, I brought some sample assessments for you um, just to, to get an idea of what we're talking about in terms of assessment. Because if you have worked in a hospital before, you're very familiar with assessing a patient and doing that just exactly how Joint Commission wants that done, right? You become very skilled in that. But this is a different type of assessment. And uh, you will begin to look at um, what we're assessing here are the um, needs of a group of people. So we have a feasibility assessment. We first of all need to know if other folks in the church are even interested in this ministry. You know, what, but you also have the ability at that same time when you're doing that assessment to find out if there might be other folks who would volunteer and help you. And that has been done in churches uh, that I've worked with they have done this feasibility study and, you know, uh, tried to gather information. At the same time, they found volunteers that they didn't even expect that were willing to step out and say, yeah, I'll, I'll help you with that. I'm not doing anything. I would love to do that. And then there's a general congregational assessment um, where we're basically looking at um, who you know, who has diabetes? So that, who has high blood pressure? You know, who has a lack of health insurance that we need to be aware of? And I'm not saying so much as who as what individuals, but what are the numbers? That will amaze you. That's the piece that will amaze you. Because on most churches that we've assessed, we found up to 50% of folks have been dealing with high blood pressure, uh, some kind of heart disease, um, diabetes, and you will begin to get a reflection of the type of illnesses that are being experienced uh, by folks in that congregation. And that will help you uh, in terms of the type of programming and information that you need to have available and providing back for folks. Um, you can also uh, assess their health habits, their lifestyle. How many people actively walk in this congregation or exercise on a regular basis? How many people have problems with overweight, would like to change their, their weight status? So you can begin to get an idea of the types of things that would interest the church members and bring people in. The other thing that you can do, um, and you need to start early, is looking at what resources you have in the church. You know, do you have a dining hall that you know you can use for education or dinners, whatever? Um, what is the capacity in that church? Uh, one thing that we've looked at, we did a program several years on that ago on that, is how accessible is your church building to people with disabilities? So 
important. If you have an older church, you find out they're not very accessible. Um, people with wheelchairs can't get in, can't get in the main door, have to really sit in the middle of the aisles, perhaps, if they're wheelchair bound, which uh, makes it difficult for others to pass. Um, you might uh, have problems with the structure in the building itself. Um, but actually, you know, looking at what you have to work with and what maybe you could influence some change around. Um, so actually looking at the physical building and then looking at the programs that are already implemented within the church. Is there a teen group? Is there a senior group? Now we're defining our populations. Is there a VBS? Is there an aftercare, uh, I'm sorry, after school program that perhaps those would be, um, you could kind of implement some health messages into some of these groups in their curriculum. For instance, uh, VBS, teaching hand washing. At VBS, take about five minutes but you can accomplish that pretty quickly. Um, so actually looking at the other programs, the other thing you want to be very careful about is when you have established committees in a church, you don't want to rock the boat. You got some people out there, you know, they're over visitation, home visitation. Well, you just want to work with them maybe, but you're not going to take that over and be doing that too. So you have to be very sensitive to what programs are already out there. You don't want to duplicate anything. You only want to make those programs stronger and you want to be helpful, uh, helpful in those situations. Um, the other thing uh, that can be done um, is you could do ass assessments of the individuals themselves in terms of finding out what their skills are you know, what their uh, work skills are, what their abilities are. Uh, when I uh, put together our uh, first church health ministry years ago, I found out that one of the persons on my committee was a big database person. So we did our little assessments, and she calculated all the data and had a spreadsheet for me. I would have never accomplished that, you know, without her. But there are folks out there that can help us with those pieces that we can do things that we would have never dreamed. The other thing is looking at our spiritual gifts. Have you ever done anything like that before where you can actually identify the strengths of a person? It might be in organization or mercy um, or um, vision. Some people are more visionary than others. And sometimes it's good to know where your strengths are and you know, be able to, to use them within the congregation. So we are all gifted, and sometimes knowing those gifts is very important. Uh, the one lady I go to church with, very quiet lady, very dedicated Christian, but we came to find out that she was really an educator. And we put her in charge of the women's Bible study group, and man, she's done it for years now and has been wonderful at it. So sometimes we really need to take the time and look at what our gifts are, what we can you know, bring to our church congregation to make it stronger. Okay, you have to have some structure um, so that everybody knows what to expect and what, how we're going to do it. So usually we have committees or work groups um, that will pull together and we'll begin to collect this uh, information. And, you know, whether it be personal information or information about the church itself, we can just delegate this. You know, give uh, Sally 10 and say, hey, see if you can get these in the next week completed for me and get them back you know, and give somebody else another 10 of them and pass them out. The one thing that you'll find is that if it's personal information, a lot of folks don't want to sign their name to it. And you can make that optional. Uh, just eliminate that barrier right from the very beginning. You know, if you want to, you can put your name on there. 
uh, and I can contact you, whatever. But if not, you know, if you just want it, if information provided without the name, that's certainly, certainly fine. Um, this type of participation uh, increases the amount of support that you have. You know, they feel like they have um, uh, provided some information that you need and it will help to mobilize the uh, group in general. You can do a walk about the church, you know, again, looking for some of the things that we talked about in terms of accessibility for the elderly or the disabled. Is there some way that the person with a hearing problem, uh, we have a gentleman in our church that has become nearly um, stone deaf in the years that I've known him, and the pastor, he prints out the whole sermon for him, and he gets that sermon in writing before it's even preached. And, uh, you know, he truly appreciates that. So we need to look at uh, those particular things. Need to understand the number of services there are per week and if there's education for what ages, if there's child care provided and during what times of the, the day so that you're aware of that when you're doing programming. Um, all churches have a personality and their characteristics are different. Now, we all think, oh, church is a church. But that isn't true. Uh, some churches are very formal. Every decision has to go through the board and the deacon's approval and the elders and all of that. And uh, others are, you just talk to a person and, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. So you need to know how that church functions on a daily basis. You know, how decisions are made in that organization. Um, there are leaders that are formal leaders and there are leaders that are informal leaders. Do we know that? Okay, so there might be, um, well we have a couple of elders and we have a couple of deacons and we have a superintendent of the Sunday school. But it's really Norma over here that makes all the decisions. <laughs> and if you want to implement something new, you've got to win over Norma. You know, so you have to know who, who the people are in place formally, but who are the others that really influence the thinking of the congregation. And you have to win those people over as well so that they're going to be supporting you. Um, we do need to know a little bit about money. Most of this stuff is done without money, okay? But there are a few things that you might need. And so you need to know how to go about that if you are going to have some sort of event that, you know, maybe you want to teach healthy cooking classes and you need to purchase some food to cook up. Um, you need to know how those decisions are made and if there's money in a budget or could we budget for something in the future and plan it. But those kinds of things you have to think about. And do you have the resources that are needed? Um, I think earlier we talked about the value of the extension offices. Oh my gosh. There are usually, there are tons of programs available for just about anything. It's just finding somebody to do the program. So you have to do a little research again and know your community, but the extension office is a wonderful one, particularly when it comes to eating, healthy eating and dining with diabetes, but there are tons of programs that they actually have. So again, you, you um, collect your data from your various assessments. I think, did we get all those passed out? Did you get a couple copies, samples of them? And these are um, samples that we're using in particular for our diabetes program that we're trying to implement in a network of churches throughout Ohio and Kentucky is considered region one. We actually have 11 counties. Uh, Ohio, Kentucky, um, Virginia, Mississippi, where we're trying to find out how many, what folks know about diabetes, how many folks have diabetes, 
and most of all, how to prevent diabetes and implementing some programming around that. So those assessments are really kind of, you know, tailored to gather that type of information. But however you develop your assessment, you know, you, you have the ability to tailor your assessment to find out the information that you want to know, okay? Um, but you're going to then be able to gather lots of different ideas and thoughts from people, and it doesn't have to be written. Sometimes you can just go to Sunday school class and stand up and talk to them and say, what would you like to see happen here to get us healthier? You know, people have tons of ideas. They really know the answers to this stuff. They just don't always do it. We don't take action and do it all. Um, they'll give you a lot of ideas, and they'll give you a lot of support then for your ministry. These again are some of the questions, um, and, and they kind of go back to what we, we heard Dr. Hannah talking about, but, you know, asking people, you know, what they really need and how can the church help them? You know, what, what do they kind of things do they believe are worthwhile to change in their congregation, but understanding the culture of the church is very important. Um, what kind of problems, health problems are in the community? I don't know about all of you, but we've had tons of problems in Portsmouth with drugs. Uh, it's been a nightmare. And, but I'm proud to say that our community's really stepped up and it just didn't want to happen anymore. I mean, we're on to it. We had at one time when we started 13 pill mills operating in the county, unlicensed. They operated just as a physician's office prescribing oxycodone to just about anybody who walked in the door. And so we had terrible addictions and they are all closed point. So um, people, when people come together to work on a health issue and really look at it passionately, it can, it can change um, the working of the community. Um, it's just a little bit more information about the written survey, you know, trying to get, you know, at least 60% participation uh, but the more complex the survey, the more time it takes for them to complete it, the more unlikely you are to get it back. <laughs> so, you know, it's best if you can hand it out, collect it the same day, so that you're for sure you're going to get it back. Um, these are some of the categories which it might help you. Uh, to arrange your, your survey into categories in terms of, um, you know, things that people, families are challenged with in terms of uh, promoting health within their family. You know, the, ch the changing nature of the family itself, the roles of people. Most women work now, you know, that means they're less available for volunteering, that they're very busy, that they're often running their children to the ball field every night and no cooking. People don't eat together anymore at night. One of our biggest health issues we found is people don't cook at home anymore. They don't eat at home as a family together anymore. Those two things alone, people need to be aware, uh, is detrimental to your health. Um, chronic disease, it's just going off the charts. You know, we have got to address the factors that are um, uh, involved with chronic disease. Interpersonal conflict and relationships, uh, and that's always a problem, but when you couple that with huge drug addictions, it's, you know, it's really damaging to the family unit. So we're going to collect this data back and we're going to analyze it. We're going to look, you know, for any missing gaps of information. We're going to actually say, you know, how many people really are interested in a weight loss program? We'll just put together our own weight loss program, you know, right here at the church. 
Encourage one another. We'll meet every Tuesday at noon and see what we can do. Have some fun with it. Um, and looking for some visible successes that we can celebrate, you know, and make known. Um, but we're, we want to look at some measurable outputs, some things that we can say we actually did in this ministry to give us a little bit of encouragement. Because, you know, when you work with an individual, they either get better or they don't. But you have a pretty good, clear sense of, you know, what you did for that person and how it helped them to progress in their illness. Now, remember, we're looking at a population of people. Lots of people. How are we going to measure our success of how we've influenced that group? Well, we can look at things like, you know, how many people were actually served, how many people came to classes, um, phone contacts. There's a wonderful program of just calling people. There's one church that I work with calls 500 families a month. They have people that just sit and work on the phones. And they know that this person can't get out, they're homebound, and they call her once a week and say, Susie, how are you doing? We really miss seeing you at church. Did you get the bulletins that we mailed to you? You know, I understand you're having a birthday. How are you going to celebrate that? 500 calls like that a month. And it is so important to these people to just know we're thinking about you, we're praying for you, and we you're going to get better and come back to church. Very important. Personal cards just mailed out to folks. You know, we know you came to visit us. We would love to have you come back to our church and congregation. This is what we can offer for you. And support groups. Those are just measurable things um, that we can actually do. Again, this is just a list of types of activities that you can organize from your church community. Uh, it doesn't have to all be a formal education class. It's, oh man, I can't get up there and teach that. I don't want to do that. It doesn't have to be that way. It can be as simple as what Diana talked about. You know, a little wellness tip in the church bulletin. Do you know that energy drinks are not good for your children? They raise their blood pressure. They're loaded with caffeine. Just simple things like that. That you need to communicate to people so that they understand what you're trying to accomplish there. Okay, um, in terms of the health counselor, which is this is what many of you are doing, uh, at this point you are working again with an individual and doing uh, individual work. You're looking at their blood work, their healthy lifestyles or lack thereof and trying to encourage that. Um, it's important that you're an active listener in this role because you've got to identify the barriers that keeps people from being successful and try to eliminate the barriers, okay, that keep us from being healthy. Excellent program. And, you know, the prayer and presence is so important. You know, where else can we pray as we administer help. Sometimes you can't do it. You know, you're not allowed to. But with your own church and with your congregational members, they share the same beliefs that you do. So you're able to do that. Sometimes people are so sick that all you can do um, is sit with them. There's a lady that I had um, sat with for probably over a year with Parkinson's that you couldn't understand a thing the woman said. But I would just talk to her. And, you know, it was awkward at first, but just being with her was what she needed. Just being with her. So don't underestimate the power of presence that you have with another individual. 
Uh, in terms of being an advocate or a change agent, again, uh, this can be done outside of the walls of the church. You know, sometimes um, we need to go to the nursing homes. We need to make sure that communion is, if you're a believer in weekly communion or, you know, whenever it's offered in your church, is that person in the nursing home able to enjoy that? If not, bring it to the attention of the leaders of the church. You know, this fellow is over here and, you know, he's really left out. He's still part of our congregation, but he's not coming here, so we just kind of forget about it, don't we? Maybe you can see that communion is taken to that person or a visit is made. Um, perhaps one of your congregational members is to a point where they really need to understand what palliative care is or what hospice care is, and you can help them understand that and accomplish the referral to actually get them involved in that. Um, so there are a number of ways that you can be an advocate for congregational members and help them. Um, again, we, we want to really look at the resources that we have in our communities. And I know sometimes it's scarce. If we live in a rural area, it is scarce to have some of the resources that we need. But we might need to reach out a little farther than our usual comfort zone and find out, you know, what are the public health systems that we could connect this person with or senior organizations that might have the ability to provide some occasional transportation to that person to a doctor's office. Or where are the local mental health facilities? They get scarcer and scarcer, don't they? How far do you have to go to get mental health when you live in Moorhead? You have mental health services here? Excellent, very good. Not all counties do, and sometimes it's difficult to find, but not only that, um, you have to look at, you know, is that access impeded by then not having insurance? So you have to look at several of the barriers that might uh, prevent that person from taking advantage of some of those services. <clears throat> then, of course, what do we do after we do the assessment, the planning, and the, uh, we always end up with the evaluation, don't we, nurses? <laughs> we have to look occasionally at what we've accomplished. You know, what did we actually do in this ministry uh, in the impact of services that we implemented? Um, and actually, it will tell you if it's a, a value to the congregation or not. And don't be afraid to share that back with at least the leaders of the church that this is what you accomplished in this period of time so that they actually know how many visits you made, how many telephone calls you made, uh, how many referrals that you made, you almost have to keep a notebook in your pocket for us and guys. <laughs> because every Sunday it happens, doesn't it? Don't you get asked, you know, who's, who's the best doctor to go to? Or if you had high blood pressure, what would you do? <laughs> it's not that high, but you know, it's a little bit high. What should I do? And you need to be able to kind of keep some notes, you know, of what you told that person. And then you need to go back with them and say, did you go? Did it work? You know, what did you find out? Are you taking your medication they ordered for you? Um, but you need to look at what value and what you actually accomplished and celebrate that on a regular basis. 